Did we win our FFPC division titles and everything that we saw in week 14? That's what we're going to talk about today. On Stealing Bananas, I'm Ben Gretsch. You can find my newsletter at bengretsch.substack.com. With me, as always, is Sean Siegel. You can find all of his great work at Rotoviz. A lot of happenings around the NFL today, Sean. A lot of injuries, a lot of low scores we were just talking about. Not Kyle Pitts. Kyle Pitts scored a touchdown. Just want to get that on the record. We've talked about Kyle Pitts a lot on the show. Not recently, because unfortunately, he's like not even that relevant anymore. But it was fun to see him down the field, catching a pass, scoring a TD. It's something that I had wanted to see for a couple of years. Um, but it seems like that in the big Drake London game led to the loss. You're always criticizing them for trying to play close games and win. They throw it successfully. It leads to a loss. I don't, I'm not sure if the takeaway here is positive for the Falcons. They, they then I have broke. Desmond Ritter on a bunch of best ball teams where the other quarterback was either hurt or on the bye this week. And he saved his one performance for the entire year that could go into the starting lineup. I say that, but Connor and I have a team that is just Desmond Ritter because Aaron Rodgers got hurt. And it is like right on the edge there. So we have managed to survive with Desmond Ritter as the one QB. It seems to me like Desmond Ritter is the story. Is is that not the case? Um, I mean, he had a good game. I was just going to say the Lennon stuff was all when they were trailing in the fourth quarter. He had a bunch of a bunch of big plays. He had a 45-yard catch with six minutes left. He had a 16-yard catch with 25 seconds left, and then a 28-yard catch down to the three with four seconds left that didn't quite get there. Um it was all just like tacked on very, it wasn't, they didn't, they didn't lose because they threw. So I think you, what you just said, I'm, I'm rejecting that hypothesis. I don't know. Run to win is what I've heard. Run, run to win. Um, Sean, we had three, two, and then you had one with calm. And then we had a third place game, FFPC championship games today. Um, and we talked about them on the show, and I'm sure the listeners are curious how they're going. We have one team in particular that we we're, we're really excited about getting in, and we have another team with uh, our buddies Pat and Pete. That one, um, unfortunately, has suffered some injuries. The lineup is not quite as strong. We ha- That's the one where we had to get Jackson Smith and Jigba into the lineup, and we had to play T. Higgins this week. And we do still have Christian McCaffrey and a lot of, a lot of options. There's still some hope for this team. Uh, it's got a Tua and Jalen Waddle stack. It, they, but at this point, where the, where the scoring stands, they would need about 30 points each for us. To they would need able, a lot, yeah, to pull that off. Um, the team that we really like that that at one point was in a really strong position. The, the team that's playing for third place already auto got an auto bid to the to the sprint. The other team of our you you and I of our the two of us of our uh, portfolio that we were really hoping to get through it's playing for the title um currently projected to win at a point today was projected to win by 50 going into Sunday night football it was more like 10 uh we're recording right now during Sunday night football which at this point has been going favorably for us in this game we're playing against the Jalen Hurts AJ Brown stack it's the middle of the third quarter. The Eagles have not been looking good. There is some potential that by the time our listeners are hearing this, they will be cringing as I say this because things will have not worked out as favorably they are trailing. And I asked you if you wanted throw. to wait to record <laughs> until the game was over, and you said, I am not watching. Yeah, and I decided. <laughs> I wasn't sure what the circumstances are. Obviously, there are family things. You can watch the games later. I'm often you know, very delayed on my watching of the games. It turns out no. You just you were you were a little nervous. It's been a nerve wracking day. The I mean the chasing solo bananas team getting absolutely hammered and things. I mean things ran off the rails there very early on when Matt Gay decided to kick a field goal off the uprights. Then I generally enjoy the kicker and defense through the season because it does add just a lot of randomness. That I mean this is for entertainment, right? So be entertained. It wasn't entertaining today. Our kicker, <laughs> our kicker for that team, who I should have split it up, but also happened to be the kicker for my team of column, a zero, 
And I mean, the kickers, they can get out there and score some serious points, <laughs> right? <clears throat> a zero. And then simultaneously, you're saying, you know, we were at one point up by, not up by, but projected to win by 50 with the way everything was going. Then how many points did the Las Vegas Raiders score today? Yeah, they scored none. This is a really funny story. We, <laughs> but we played many, against. How many defenses against, did we have yeah. this morning at like eight, nine o'clock when we were finalizing our bids? We had four defenses at that point. Sean um, noticed that our opponent was very likely to be picking up a defense in the championship matchup. Their two defenses on their roster were Buffalo and Tennessee playing Kansas City and Miami. Um, and so we had some flexibility with our roster. We were going to potentially pick up a, another kicker. We, we, we had some flexibility, some drop options. Um, and so we decided to add some additional defenses. And this person was low on fab money successfully got two defenses that they, uh, tried to bid on and were not able to get, they were left with the uh the minnesota vikings who pitched a shutout and scored 22 points we won over them houston who we ended up playing against the jets they scored six <laughs> well there are just so many funny directions to take this right because we have the performance from zach wilson that may have saved his career i and know i was his laughing career. <laughs> like, I mean, now he has a chance to be a long-term backup somewhere else, right? I mean, those right. But then the second he has to, a team has to turn to him. It's going to be miserable. It's it's so funny that he's going to be a backup again. Sorry, I think that somewhere down the line he can be competent. Drew, Drew Lock. <laughs> Drew Lock moved the ball at times today, right? And there were a lot of hilarious keys. So, I mean, we talk about deserving to win the league or not. We've got to go into another. I mean, so the the kick up, the kicker pickups were mere prelude to. Then there's all this focus early in fantasy drafts, but should you add Josh Allen? Should you pick Jalen Hurts? You know, do you want to wait on Joe Burrow? Is Tua going to be the breakout star? Maybe Anthony Richardson will light the world on fire. It turns out C.J. Stroud is the true answer. Who obviously his miracle run comes to a very sort of unfortunate stop today i don't know at any point along the way people were saying just pick up joe flacco in week 14 that is actually the answer yeah the funny part about these defenses i guess the positive part is we had gino howell and we did pick up flacco to we cut one of those defenses to pick up flacco we were gonna pick up you know other options but or potentially hold three different defenses we wound up Cutting one for a, a second kicker, potentially for the sprint, looking ahead a little bit, cutting another uh, for Flacco, who did score 25-plus points, which was really nice. Um, however, uh, yeah, we lost 16 points to the defense situation where we outbid. The, our opponent got their third favorite option and um, outscored their second favorite option, which was in our lineup, by 16. That's the way the cookie crumbles, as they say. <laughs> Let's focus on the positive. Joe Flacco today, 311 yards, three touchdowns, only throws one pick. It was right to the defenders. No offensive players in the vicinity. Yeah, what happened on that play? Well, clearly he misread it. And then when his guys actually broke away from where it was, he still actually had the ball in his hand, but you could kind of see his brain operating on, well, I had already made the read this way. I'm going to go ahead and let it go and just assume nothing bad will happen. But since it was right <laughs> directly into the hands of the defenders, no, that was a pick. But he only takes one sack, and due to a bunch of hilarious broken coverages by the Jaguars, often his guys were trotting into the end zone uncovered, and that includes David Njoku going 691 and two ben this made me very happy because you have a team with evan silva where you were nervous about whether njoku was going to be healthy for this week you were in the same situation with the quarterbacks and my understanding we just kind of texted on this i haven't verified this before recording the show but i'm under the impression that going for third place today that you guys won in a route 
based on Joe Flacco to David Njoku, two players who, well, one shouldn't be in the NFL and the other one a very <laughs> middling tight end. Well, what's funny is we actually wound up with uh, Jake Browning on this team. I, I wanted to grab Flacco, but we wound up with Browning. He actually scores more than Flacco. So we had Browning and Njoku and Brees Hall on this roster. Yeah, 163 it put up. It's not winning in a route necessarily. It is uh, projected to win by 10 because our opponent also had a really strong day, included DJ Moore, Josh Allen, um, and has a lot of points left to play, including Tyreek Hill tomorrow. So it's and it's just a third place game. It's not one we're going to spend a ton of time on. Shot Joe Flacco became the first Brown. This is from Dan Murphy, the Cleveland Browns official uh, PR guy, director of football communications. Joe Flacco became the first Brown to throw three touchdown passes of at least 30 yards in the same game since Brian Sipe on December 21st, 1980. <laughs> Shout out Joe Flacco. I'm, I'm very grateful for those plays. As I said, there was about 30 yards of separation as well, because in each case, at least two out of the three, the Jaguars were just covering other players. <laughs> So what is yeah. what is with the Jaguars and I mean that's a bad passing defense. Well, they if you've read Blair's wrong read article, has it was fantastic again this week. He I mean the Jaguars defense has been going in the wrong direction at the same time that then they they have the injury to Christian Kirk. There was a great play today by Parker Washington filling in for him, scoring a touchdown. I think also a kind of backbreaking fumble by Parker Washington in that game. This was another one where, I mean, the Cleveland Browns know what's coming with a limited Trevor Lawrence. Although, I mean, Lever Lawrence got out there and ran a couple times. I, the thing you have to keep in mind here is that for him to have played in this game and looked as good as he did, the injury actually wasn't that significant. But despite that fact, there was a ton of guts that he demonstrated you know, kind of across the board today, really played, you know, fairly well. Only averaged five yards per attempt, but you're going up against a good defense. You throw the three touchdowns. Some of the situations when you get down early, I mean, three three picks and four sacks is not great. But, I mean, this rushing offense, basically with Travis Etienne, we're just grateful that he got in the end zone today. They did have one little stretch where they were willing to throw him the ball, and he looks fantastic in the receiving game. That's the part I don't really get. Anytime that they throw the ball to him, he looks unbelievable, but they only do it in these rare one-off drives where they're going quick. Evan Ingram, massive, massive game. This was a, a pretty entertaining game, especially when you think of the consequences. Cleveland Browns get to eight and five. The Jaguars fall to eight and five with the Chiefs losing again today. I mean, these teams, you know, all in the mix for seeding. This was a, a stealth entertaining game. I also did come away with it. Just Elijah Moore is not good. <laughs> I, I don't know how many times you can kind of be right there. They're not even exactly drops because he manages to contort his body into a form where, I mean, his hands aren't on the ball that well. Any other thoughts on this one or how the, it impacted your, your fantasy performance? I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, well, they, I mean, they, they, I mean, they need to get Kareem Hunt a touchdown, even though, you know, Jerome Ford looked fantastic. A lot of weirdness in this game, but I mean, it was entertaining. There were fantasy points scored. Yeah, I think um, we've talked a lot over the last two years about the mobile quarterbacks and some of the evolution of these offenses. And then, and then especially this year, young quarterbacks and backup quarterbacks. And, the level of quarterback play. And we talked last week after Flacco's first game about you know, just having a competent, even stationary quarterback, what it can mean for an NFL offense, even against the, the cover two shells or whatever the defenses are doing. Um, and we've lost a lot of those types of pocket passers over the last five years in the NFL broadly. Right. And we need to kind of build the quarterback position back up because, you know, it starts with Manning and it's Brady and it's breeze and it's rivers and it's Roethlisberger and it's Eli Manning. Even, I mean, he's got, you can get down to Eli you can get down to Flacco and uh, yeah, they're not amazing. Matt Ryan, they're not amazing, but in their good years, we're able to support offenses, complete a lot of passes. One of the things I wrote about in signals, once we found out Flacco was going to be, 
playing for these guys and had signed with them going into the first game was that you'd probably see a much higher number of completions and that you had this entirely different range of pass attempt volume, the potential for 50 plus, right? I think I said the potential to, to get up words of 60 and, and with like 40 feeling like a really easy and gettable number. There's a lot of quarterbacks right now and a lot of offenses where 40 pass attempts is a massive ceiling. I mean, we're really seeing 30 or below in almost every game. Flacco, 44 and 45 in his two games. And he hasn't even completed 60% of his passes in either game, but 23 and 26 completions, that's a ton. That's I mean, for the 2023 NFL, it's a ton. And they combined for 95 in this game, the two quarterbacks together in terms of total passing attempts. The other thing, I mean, you're mentioning the pocket passers, and you know, I kind of joked on the show earlier this week about serving and you know these guys like a Joe Flacco in some cases being able to still really throw it. And it's it's mind-boggling how like big an arm Joe Flacco still has. I mean, the thing in that big run with the Ravens, he had the miracle Super Bowl run where he actually is accurate for a handful of games and the Ravens look absolutely unstoppable. I mean, he struggled with accuracy for most of his career. But when Joe Flacco drops back to pass and sees a guy open deep, I mean, you get the impression he's trying to hold himself back because he has so much that if he doesn't more or less just toss it out there, it's going to go 20 yards over the guy's head. I mean, he's throwing balls 30, 40 yards down the field with without you know, trying, like flat footed and just flick of the wrist. Like, like yeah. it's nothing. Like it's absolutely nothing. And, you know, the game that really like, drove me out of my mind today offered a very stark contrast and doesn't necessarily mean that in any way, shape, or form, I'm saying Joe Flacco is better than Jerry Goff. But you have strength and weaknesses on different players. And as Colin and I were going into this game today, where we're playing Goff and Amon Ra and Laporta together, and you know that Amon Ra and Laporta have been huge this year, just absolute monsters, and they've carried Goff with them, at least to an extent, and he's supported them. But you also know that there is that risk in any given game that he won't play well, that the Lions will do a lot of dumb things like trying to establish David Montgomery to absolutely no purpose. And that if that happens, those three guys can take your full team down together and you just won't even feel like you're in it, which is more or less what happened today. And it's not just that that happened, but there was a play in this game. And it's it's frustrating that we're at this point in 2023 when Jamison Williams has flashed a handful of times. He can show off those crazy wheels on end arounds and different trick plays, but they mostly are still going to guys like Josh Reynolds and Khalif Raymond in the actual passing attack. But there was a play today where he gets open beyond the Chicago bears defense and then starts to look up for the ball and can't find it. And it's because the ball was 15 yards back the other direction. I mean, he would have had a 70 yard touchdown. Joe, Joe, Jared Goff underthrew him by like 15 yards. I love and it. Wasn't, the, and it was something where like he couldn't throw it further. It's just a complete yeah. lack of arm strength that was the thing that <clears throat> destroyed that relationship there with the Rams. And he's been fantastic the last couple of years. You've got to give him credit for that. But you can also see where it's a huge weakness and something certain but, defenses in certain games, the defenses can exploit. And in certain games, it's a real problem. I've, I've said this to you. I think it's a real issue for him outdoors like that. And I, I've, I've stolen that from other people's takes. And I don't know if there's a lot of research that's been done on it, but Jared Goff does not play well outdoors. Like he, he does better in you know a little bit of a controlled environment that play. Uh, I know exactly which one you're talking about. And they cut back and you, you see Williams running and you see the ball fall and you're like, okay, that wasn't close. And they cut back to Goff, and he's already jogging off the field. And it's like, usually the quarterback's still kind of standing there, looking, pointing, saying something about the route, doing something. But he just put the ball up and then was like off the field before it even landed, like or started to move off the field before it even landed. Because he's like, I can't throw it that. Like, he knew. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he was already halfway. It wasn't a shake of the head. It wasn't anything. It was like, this is just a, a known thing. I, I'm chin held high running off the field because there's nothing I can do. That guy's too fast for my arm. <laughs> was, 
It was wild. It, it was too bad. It was too bad. And at the same time, I mean, Amon Ross St. Brown has had almost the perfect career to this point. You think about how he more or less immediately, once he got going there, I mean, he's a pick around 100 in the draft and performed like a top 10 draft pick. He has this insane run of games with a 30% target share. You look at his you know, actual fantasy scoring over the 2023 season where he's very much living up to that one, two turn pick value. He gets open at will on every single play. He's the perfect outlet for Jared Goff. They've included him on some deeper routes occasionally, which is something that you predicted before the season started. He's fantastic with the ball in his hands. He had a horrific game today. The first bad game I think he's played as a pro. He was breaking off routes, probably reading the defense wrong, certainly not in concert with Goff. And he had multiple drops, including a late play that's not, I mean, depending on what your definition of a drop is and how you want to chart things, it's another one of the throws that Goff didn't really successfully make, but it's a fourth and long where Amon Ra gets open and wide open and Goff gets the ball to him and Amon Ra has to go to the ground to make the catch. And he goes to the ground and it hits him in the chest. And, you know, once you've made that sliding play and you're there with your hands and you are a superstar NFL receiver, I mean, you you have to make that catch. He had so many plays on the field, like four different plays today that you have to make as Amon Ross St. Brown, as your team is struggling against the Chicago Bears. He didn't make any of them. There was plenty of blame to go around today in Detroit as they just got manhandled, mauled, embarrassed by the Chicago Bears. The Bears let them up a couple weeks ago when they dominated that game. Also, they didn't let them up today. And I mean, the Lions did the same things that they've been doing. They did run effectively at times, but the Chicago Bears have been an elite run defense over the last month to six weeks. We need completely shut people down. And again, there's this kind of macho element of sort of proving that you're stars you've got david montgomery you've got jameer gibbs you're better than what the defense is going to do and that you're not going to let yourself get in the situation where a defense like the bears that's been so dominant against the run that that's going to take you out of what you want to do you're never going to capitulate to the opponent just because they have a strength on defense you're not going to let them funnel you to the other side and yet they were actively running the game out on themselves in the fourth quarter it's like it's one thing to do it stubbornly in the first yeah. quarter. And it's, it's something, yeah. too, where, I mean, they would argue, I think, in this game that they were successful. Jameer Gibbs just. Oh, they uh, were. I mean. By the box score, 11 carries for 66 yards for Gibbs, 6 per carry, 10 for 66 for Montgomery, 6.6 per carry. Both of them over 6 yards per carry. And, I mean, Gibbs, Gibbs is unbelievable. The other thing, too, when you're talking about how Jerry Goff gets to those final stats, Gibbs, I just – I was blown away by just how fast he is again. And even on carries up the middle, I mean, he has that ability to take the little, you know, stutter steps sideways to get to the hole and then burst through the hole. And it, I mean, you don't necessarily want to get ahead of yourself saying things like this, but it's similar really to Jamal Charles where, I mean, Charles was a little dude, but you know, if there's a better run the ball up the gut back in NFL history than Jamal Charles, you know, I would challenge people to find him. I talk all the time about yards before contact because the guys who have the ability to make the first player miss or to see the hole and hit the hole fast enough that you get to the hole. I mean, there are plenty of guys who can break tackles. You think about someone who's on a variety of our teams and I'm rooting for Javante Williams, Ben, he gets his first rushing touchdown of the season today. He did score some points. I just, I, <laughs> Javante Williams is kind of in that Austin Eckler category where you're not going to need to worry about whether or not he's going to put his name on the fastest ball carriers. You've got to be able to get through that hole. And Jamal Charles, the yards before contact in some of those seasons would be higher than these guys average for, you know, their, (laughs) their total yard per carry. Gibbs has that explosiveness. He can do it up the middle. He can get out on the edge. He created a bunch of big plays today. He dropped a pass from Jared Goff that, that, where they got him on the edge. Where, that was bad. And, and there were defenders there, but they were spaced in such a way with his speed. I mean, yeah, there's a really decent likelihood that that would have been a touchdown. 
I, I immediately get in my head, I was like, man, this guy had such a ridiculous yards per out run in college. I haven't looked at his drop rates, but I bet he didn't drop a whole lot of passes, right? Because it's hard enough to just get the targets that he was getting per route. And then how efficient he was. I mean, I, I bet he caught almost everything he saw in college. Not something that I've seen him do yet in the pros. That's maybe one of the first drops of his NFL. Or I mean, his football career. I mean, it, I'm sure it doesn't happen a lot for him. I think was he was bad. scanning the field there and is thinking, I've got this. I mean, there is nobody yeah. who's going to be able. It's like, I can beat the angles on all these guys. They're not, you know, they're not together. You've got them at three different levels. I can beat all those guys individually. <laughs> yeah. It just, it, it was too bad. The guys didn't make but, plays. And the Bears took away Sam Laporta. <laughs> and when you take away Laporta, I mean, those other guys have to do it. And they, they were really disappointed today. A, a few thoughts on them. They get. Denver, it looks like this game, maybe it has been flexed because on one site, I'm still seeing it over on Pro Football Reference, still seeing it as a Sunday game on ESPN. They have it as a Saturday night game now. They get Denver at home. If I was going to, I mean, they're inside, I was going to emphasize. And then also the fact that you might get a home game on a short week is usually a benefit. Then they go to Minnesota. We'll have an extra day there, another dome game. Uh, and then Dallas, another Saturday game after that. That's going to be a road game, tough one another indoor game then back home against Minnesota I guess that will be week 18 that won't matter but the three games uh to close out the fancy season all indoors all weather controlled uh if there is some concern about some of the condition stuff that I was mentioning uh and and they haven't played outdoors since um that Baltimore game where they looked terrible and so and, and then before that they had a Tampa game they had a Green Bay game before that um, well, you often reference that New England game last year where last it was year. just a, it stood out like a sore thumb in, in contrast to everything else where they didn't always win, but they were so competitive and they scored so many points and they play in New England and they look like they're competing for the number one overall seed or overall pick. pick. Column, again, message that to me before the game. He's like, jerk off, not good outside. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, we were, we have we were nervous. We, it happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had that to look forward to going forward, though, at least with the Bears, hopefully. The other thing, I, I want to go back to sort of the macro thing where we were talking about um, Flacco and pocket passers and those things. I do think we're heading back. Uh, I think a, a lot of teams started to be very pass aggressive and and pass on early downs a couple of years ago. 2020, that, that year, we got a lot of, you know, high PROE teams, the breakout offenses were willing to throw and um it was it was a lot of fun one of the big stories of 2022 and i talked about this a little bit so i haven't talked about it as much in 2023 is that it's almost like we would have to we, we might need to change that expectation of pass rate expectation because we had so many teams in the negative in terms of pass rate over expectation but in 2022 it sort of made some sense because teams were rushing really efficiently and and the defenses were new and a lot of those things Last week, I, I noticed this in, in looking through the pass rate over expected numbers, and it, it kind of shocked me, but there was like six or eight teams that were – I uh, sorry, there was at least – I, I want to say about eight. There was more than six that were in double digits negative. And, you know, I look at this stuff every week. There's just never weeks like that. It was a lot of teams going really, really run heavy. I wrote about it a little bit and that I, I kept emphasizing when I was going game by game that this was this team's lowest pass rate over expected of the year. And there were, I think, about five or six teams that they had their lowest pass rate over expected last year. I think we're heading back into a period where a stat as simple as pass rate over expected, a willingness to throw on early downs and in non-obvious situations and to start first and 10 series with passes and attack defenses makes a massive difference in the efficiency of the offense overall. That was a really strongly correlated thing in that like 2020 2021 range when i started looking at pass rate over expected a lot heavier it was about that time maybe it was 2019 i can't remember exactly when i started looking at it for stealing signals but it was such a good indicator of the good offenses and some of that's because they have good quarterbacks and then their teams are willing to throw but there are offenses that maybe don't even have good quarterbacks that then look good because they're willing to throw and like a great example right now i was just looking at is the Packers. They don't play until Monday night. We're recording this Sunday night, so we don't have any comments on them in week 14, but they've been really good over weeks 12, 13, et cetera, and their pass rate of expected has been trending really high. Matt LaFleur has been calling passes in non-obvious situations, putting Jordan Love 
in situations where it's dropping back to read the field when the defense is not in an obvious pass defense, they're using the run to then, um, or at least the the illusion of the run on, on potential run downs to then create positive passing situations. One of their big plays in week 13 was a fourth and one downfield throw that ended up being a big play to Romeo Dobbs down into the red zone. They've done that really, really well. I mention all this because we, Sean, we often highlight, and, and it came to my mind as you were talking about the Lions rushing effectively in this game and still running when they were down in the second half. We often highlight when teams that still run effectively sometimes still lose despite it. I mean, it's, it's I mentioned it. Both Gibbs and Montgomery had six yards per carry. They both had, they had 11 and 10 carries, both had double digit carries. He combined their number 21 carries for these two backs at over six yards per carry. Think about that as just as one back. That would be an incredible rushing day. It'd be 132 yards. Am I doing the math right? Yeah. 21 carries, 132 yards, a touchdown between the two of them combined, over six yards per carry. Incredible day. They got beat 28-13 to a team that's inferior to them. And a lot of those yards were racked up in the second half, as you noted, when they should have been throwing. And it's, I think, just a... An interesting uh, box score when you look at, yeah, I mean, in part of it, like they couldn't get the job done passing. Goff throws a couple picks in this game, takes four sacks. They were struggling in terms of his completion percentage and to actually get the ball down the field. He averages, uh, looks like fewer than five yards per attempt. Passing, like, yeah, I mean, their rushing per attempt was was outright more efficient than their passing in this game. That's not great. And having said that, you're not going to win if you continue to rush when you're trailing. That's just like you end up... I get it. That's why they kept running, but they also lost 28-13. I mean, that's we talk about this time and time again. I just want to emphasize it again, this idea of pass rate over expected. We've talked about it a lot over the last few years, and I think it's getting more important again here in 2023 after I think a little bit of a lull last year. And there's a lot of teams that aren't willing to do it, and there's ones that are willing to look bad. I mean, one of the things we used to talk about a couple of years ago, Sean, is like this willingness to – like to lose by a lot if you have to, because you're willing to throw into bad situations, right? You're willing to take risks. We used to talk about this with Ryan Fitzpatrick a lot, right? Like he would throw three interceptions in a second half when his team's trailing, but then the other weeks when he actually hit on those aggressive plays, we would talk about him as being Ryan Fitz magic, right? Like that's where he got the nickname was a willingness to be aggressive. Sometimes it looked like a total meltdown and then we all laughed and it was yada, yada, but it's that aggressiveness. It's a willingness to throw interceptions. It's a willingness to melt down because the game situation dictates it. We have too many teams that are too conservative again in the NFL, which was a big talking point a few years ago. And I felt like we got through that and we've gotten back to a point where it's bad again. And I think to help these young quarterbacks and the ones that aren't good enough, you do need to throw on non-obvious passing downs. You do need to have a high pass rate over expected pass to set up the run. There's not enough coaches willing to do that right now. The Lions down 28 to 13 get the ball back with nine minutes to go in the fourth quarter. The first four plays are to David Montgomery. So it's not just that they're not using Amon Ross St. Brown and Sam Laporta. It's not just that they're not throwing the ball. They're not, they're also not giving the ball to the guy who has a chance to break a 70 yard touchdown run. Now David Montgomery does have one of those this year, but I mean, it's, when you think about the likelihood of something happening in the future, obviously super low for David Montgomery. It's super low for any back, but Jameer Gibbs with that type of speed, you have at least the small possibility. Those four plays are successful plays. And I think that Ben Johnson would say, yeah, those are successful plays. And as soon as we gave Jared Goff the ball, he blew the, the drive again, right? But those first four plays ran more than two minutes off the clock and you're instantly in a situation where you still have to gain all the yardage that you needed originally, and you now have two fewer minutes to do it with. You're down to seven minutes in the game, and you're not going to have enough possessions to do anything other than be perfect because you're going to have to score a touchdown, get a stop, score a touchdown, and get a two-point conversion. You, you simply have to play faster. And again, if the Detroit Lions are going to compete with teams like the Dallas Cowboys and the Philadelphia Eagles and the San Francisco 49ers in the reality playoffs you've got to be able to use Amon Ross St. Brown and Sam LaPorta which they have this season but one of the issues that we're running into right now with the Lions is they have two backs who are so good or at least you have Jameer Gibbs and then a, a player they really like and want to use in David Montgomery that in order to get them the snaps that you need in a game 
it has to come out of the passing offense, which is a big problem if you haven't done it after you're up by, say, three scores. And one of the best articles on football that I've ever read came from the Fantasy Douche back in 2013 or 2014. I think it was probably early in 2014. And it was this just magical breakdown of the way teams with better running backs would struggle as a result of having good running backs because then they would run more often than was optimal. And how players like a Marshawn Lynch, who was turning his career around and starting to emerge with the Seahawks, how you could look at the numbers and see how much players like that were actually hurting their teams by being good. And obviously in the decades since there's been, you know, so much research on that. And I think that at times to the point where people have overstated it, right. Where you and I have argued that, you know, the 49ers decision to make that trade for Christian McCaffrey was not only as a no brainer, but something that does seem like it could potentially put them in position to win multiple Super Bowls. If nothing else, it makes them incredibly hard to stop and really fun to watch every week. You think about someone like a Bijan Robinson. And the funny thing is that the Falcons with Bijan have been a worse running team this year than they were last year. But you can understand how that pick would work in the modern NFL. I think you can understand how the Gibbs pick would work, but not if you're also going to let David Montgomery touch the ball that often, right? If you have two running backs, it almost multiplies the problem that you have if you have an Adrian Peterson, a player like that, where now you just, in order to get these guys the touches, you don't have the balance and the play calling that you need. This was a disastrously bad game by Ben Johnson. If he wants to be an NFL head coach, obviously he does at some point. He turned down some opportunities last year. He may still want to show what he can do with the Lions for a while, but I mean, he's going to have to be a lot better. I mean, they, they simply look bad and they look clueless. And if you're going to say, okay, our QB has some weaknesses in the weather outdoors you're going to have to come up with solutions that are more than just calling all of these early down running plays, including when you get behind. And again, part of it has to be Amon Ross St. Brown. But one of the things that jumped out to me today, and again, I could certainly understand, and I would understand the feedback. It'd be interesting in the discussion with people who disagree, but the Chiefs looked so much better today on offense because Pacheco was not available. Now, yeah. CEH looked awful. I mean, he looked awful. He can't play. He should not be on an NFL roster. But because they have two backs that you can't really give the ball to in pure rushing situations, they were more aggressive. They get the ball to Travis Kelsey. You get this beautiful touchdown to Rasheed Rice. You have the incredible play design and execution on the touchdown at the end that gets called back because Kadarius Tony doesn't know where the line of scrimmage is. And I mean, they look like the team that is a Super Bowl champion. Because as we've talked about on the show, the Buffalo Bills, even though they were 6-6 six and six coming in, are one of the two or three, certainly one of the five best teams in football. It was a must-win for them. They get the win. I would argue that in some ways it was a must-win for the Chiefs as well yeah. if they wanted to really be in position to defend. And it was a well-played game in so many ways. The Chiefs had battled back. Their defense you know, played well. After you get down 14 and nothing, the Chiefs dominate that game. It's yet another game where one of the receivers finds a way to blow it. This one more unique and more creative than simply dropping the ball or laterally into the opponent. I mean, Patrick Mahomes looked fantastic. This was a great football game, but if they had had Pacheco, the Chiefs would have gotten blown out. Yeah, we talked about this off the air last week. I don't think we got around to it, but I'm going to go back to another week 13 game. Weird move for our Sunday night show. Or week 14, but the Packers beat the Chiefs in week 13. Uh, and it, it was hard to kind of understand why a little bit because the Chiefs were somewhat efficient on offense. If you go look at the game breakdown, on average, NFL teams have about 11 possessions a, uh, a game. Sean, we always talk about this as a game of possessions and what you're able to do when you actually have the opportunities. Good teams should want there to be more possessions when you pass there are incompletions, there's more plays, there's more volume in the game, gives you more of an opportunity to establish your dominance over the course of the game. Bad teams want to shorten the game, they want to keep Patrick Mahomes off the field. We've heard this said a million different ways. You want to run the ball, keep Patrick Mahomes off the field, etc. The Packers were able to shorten this game to a degree that I don't know that I had really ever seen in a long time. Both teams essentially only had seven possessions. The Chiefs technically had eight. One of them was a nine-second possession before half where they just kneeled because the Packers were able to get 
Uh, the clock wound all the way down to the half when they, they they punted before half. But essentially, both teams only had two possessions in the whole first half. Um, or excuse me, the Packers had a third because they punted on their third. The Chiefs kicked field goals on both of those. They were long possessions. They were productive possess- possessions. Packers scored TDs on both of those. Chiefs came back in the second half, scored touchdowns on both of their first two in the second half. Their first four possessions, they scored. Two touchdowns, two field goals. But because the Packers first of all, cut the possessions way down in the game and then also executed in the red zone and were able to get touchdowns on theirs. And then they punted on their third, but got a touchdown on their fourth in the third quarter. They were up 21 to 20, I guess, at that point. Um, And they end up going on to win. They're also, I guess it was 21 to 19. uh, Kansas City had gone for two. They go on to win. They're, you know, uh, aided a little bit by some of the variants in the fourth quarter. There's a missed PI on, on Marcus Valdez Scantling. There's an interception that obviously is favorable when you get one, you get Patrick Mahomes to throw an interception in the fourth quarter. But the point is, you limit the number of possessions, you get down to just a few key possessions in the fourth quarter, and you're in this game and you're able to, you're, you're the underdog. You're able to upset the Chiefs, despite the fact that their first four drives, they scored on all four of them. And you pointed out to me, I was pointing out to you, look at the Packers drives. The reason they were able to to cut it to seven drives total, five of those seven were four minutes or longer. Everyone had seven plays in it. The only one that was under three minutes was the one right before half when they got the ball with 219 and they ran 210 off and then punted, left nine seconds on the clock. You said to me, well, look at those two Chiefs drives. The Chiefs first two drives were seven minutes and eight minutes, over 15 minutes, 13 plays and 14 plays because they were running the ball, they in many ways played what you said exactly to me so correctly. They played into what the Packers would have wanted to do philosophically. It's a tactical sport. We talk about it's a game of possessions. You can't. The fact that Isaiah Pacheco ran in this game 18 times for 110 yards hurt the Chiefs and helped the Packers. And that's your point about how this game this week went and how their offense looked without Pacheco. You can't, as the superior team, succumb to the fact that you're running efficiently when it means that then you're shortening the game and putting yourself in those types of situations that the Chiefs put themselves in that game in Green Bay where that game really was shrunk in terms of possessions. This week's game against the Bills, a little bit more chaotic, a lot more possessions overall. The classic Bills-Chiefs game. What did you think of it as a Chiefs fan? I mean, that, that Kelsey play at the end was incredible. Wish it would have counted, obviously. Wish we could have seen potentially Josh Allen get an opportunity to, to answer that. Um, I'm sure Bills fans will take it just the way that it was because they needed a close win after all their close losses this year. Um, but, yeah, I mean, a, a tough loss. I'm with you. It feels a lot like a, a Chiefs. Uh, like not necessarily a must win, but it was a big Chiefs game. The talking point on social after was that the Chiefs might be playing their first road playoff game in the Patrick Mahomes era this year because they are now down to eight and five. They're trending towards potentially being the three seed and having to play, uh, you know, a road playoff game in the divisional round and then additionally in the conference championship potentially. They've been the two seed before one and then had the one seed get upset. The year Tennessee was the one seed. I know that happened. And so they've they've never actually played a road game in the Patrick Mahomes era, um, but what do you what do you think as a Chiefs fan how this went and, and where it puts them at right now? Yeah, I mean it's it's tough to have them lose this one because again you know the Bills are really good and it feels like they outplayed them especially from that early deficit they definitely outplayed them. It was great to see them limit Josh Allen. One of the things that has been the case. And one of the reasons why I continue to point out that I don't really, I just feel like that's weird and unfortunate scapegoating that their offensive coordinator was fired is that, I mean, Josh Allen and the bills have been like one of the only offenses that has moved the ball at will this season. And to see Kansas city really limit them, Josh Allen averages less than six yards per attempt. He takes three sacks. He throws a pick. They're able to hold Stefan Diggs. I mean, from a fantasy football perspective, the fact that Diggs is four for 24 in this game, yet another one of the big time stars who's completely wiped out today. One of the reasons why you and I are in decent shape, despite <laughs> the Minnesota Vikings defensive points, is that Mike Evans, who's playing for our opponent, got completely wiped out in the game today. 
Uh, so although you know, although he also had Rashad White and Kate Otten and got late touchdowns for both of them, which drove me nuts because for a bit there it looked like Arthur Smith was going to play to our favor and the Bucks were going to get like they were going to run that game out. It was going to be seven possessions on both sides, and all three of the Bucks in our opponents lineup were going to were going to bust. But Evans was the only one at the end. Uh, Otten and uh, White were able to get in. And the Otten score is is frustrating. The other thing here that you know I would kind of know when we talk about the the Bills offense is that James Cook was really really good and it's something where I do encourage teams to play to your stars and not get hung up in some of the mistakes you have to work through those and figure out ways to make sure that you are enhancing your players ability to develop and to be a big time contributor as opposed to limiting them. I mean, cook today as both a rusher and a receiver, just utterly electric. This is the guy that, you know, looks like he could be the next Austin Eckler type of player. And so has he hit fully in 2023? Clearly not. I mean, the fact that Latavius Murray is involved, the fact that, you know, they have added Ty Johnson to have another guy because Latavius Murray is in fact, not very good. I mean, you have to have backup running backs, right? But they have not embraced him until this game today with the 15 touches that just, I mean, won the game. The chiefs were able to stop everything else. And so I do think you have to give the bills some credit for unleashing their running back star, because that does matter from the chiefs perspective. You know, once you don't have Pacheco, siphoning off all of these snaps in an NFL football game and you get back to Patrick Mahomes being the guy running the show, then you get 10 targets for Travis Kelsey. You get 10 targets for Rasheed Rice. Those guys combined for 150 yards. It wasn't a huge game for Rice. And there is a situation where, you know, you go back to, you know, well, why did the Chiefs lose? And McHadarius Tony is offside and Rasheed Rice fumbles. And you simply can't have the rice mistake either. We can't just give him a free pass again in a situation where you have a limited number of total possessions, but the 20 targets for the two stars and to have rice emerge. If the chiefs actually win this game, then I think that you say the chiefs at nine and four, and especially, you know, if the Rams (laughs) don't give up the punt return touchdown in overtime and the Ravens lose, which is the way that it looked for decent chunks of the game today, then suddenly you're back to thinking, okay, the chiefs are, in control of the AFC and not that they're more likely than not any individual team in the AFC, you would definitely take the field against in 2023, but you would like their chances to lose the game really does change things from a path perspective, even though, I mean, you just desperately hope that the chiefs and Andy Reid are looking at this game. They're looking at rice and looking at what Mahomes is able to do with the 43 attempts and thinking, yeah, it doesn't matter just how passive defenses are playing against us or just how much they're giving up. One of the things that you can do, you can do it with our advanced stat explorer. Obviously, you can do it other places. You can look at the yards before contact that defenses are giving up to the Kansas City backs and the Kansas City rushing offense. And if you had any question, which you know anybody who's watching the games <laughs> certainly probably doesn't, but I mean, the incentives that teams have to get the Chiefs to run the ball are so extreme that backs like Pacheco, and again, you can go back to his peripherals last year. In some ways, that's a little unfair because rookies do, in many cases, put up weaker numbers as rookies and then go on to do more special things. And one of the guys that you, you see, you know, very obviously in that category as well this year would be a Rashad White, who's having, you know, yeah. in the midst of a, a fantastic season. Uh, but I mean, Pacheco, you go back to college, you look at last season, you look at these different things. I mean, he is not the guy who is creating this before contact yardage. The Chiefs are looking at that, and they're looking at their own receiving core, which makes mistakes every week, and they're saying, we've got to take what the defense gives you. I mean, you're paying hundreds of millions of dollars to Patrick Mahomes, and he's a MVP. He's the best player in football. I mean, he's one of the greatest players of all time. The ball cannot be in Isaiah Pacheco's hands. It simply can't. Yeah. And I, I thought they looked good today. I thought that, I mean, obviously it's exciting for the Bills and, and their fans. Uh, it's too bad. I mean, again, it's just too bad that the Kadarius Tony is offside. And, you know, you don't want to 
harp on that too much because anybody can make mistakes. Obviously, anytime I play sports, I make mistakes all the time. You know, people talk about, well, this is a, a mental mistake. You can't make mental mistakes the same way you can't physical mistakes. And I mean, there's a truth to that. And yet the, at the same time, I mean, he obviously thinks he's lined up correctly and you have to be in many cases <laughs> right up there. The thing that that frustrates me, even though you're going to have some of these mistakes coming off of that past interference with MVS last week. And then to be in a situation here where this touchdown gets wiped out. And then two plays later, the bills end falls into the neutral zone. <laughs> and you know, the officials completely and totally ignore it. It's like, you just called our guy for, I mean, Tony was flagrantly illegal. It's not like they can let that go, <laughs> but you have to call the next penalty that happens just two plays later. Right. And that's a play where, yeah, I mean, the Chiefs aren't in a great situation, but you give Patrick Mahomes one more try. Who knows what happens? I mean, you, you want to see, and for fans of football too, you think back to the playoff game a couple of years ago, one of the things that would have been so exciting about this situation is that when the Chiefs score, if that play doesn't get wiped out, Josh Allen is getting the ball back yeah. with a minute 10 or whatever it is. And you're going to get to see a fantastic finish. You're going to get to see maybe the game of the year. And instead, it's just like, okay, it ends. <laughs> So lots of different Speaking, things going on here, but it, it was too bad because otherwise this was a fantastic game. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And and getting to see Allen come back would have really been, I mean, would have been a treat, frankly. Um, speaking of games ending, and this is one that I need to go back and watch, but uh, the Dallas and Philly game has ended. You earlier were upset about the kicker and DST stuff. We talked through how our opponent scored 22 DST points and our DST scored six. Our kicker was Jake Moody. He had four extra points. We got four out of our kicker, six out of our D, 10 total. Their D already got 22. Do you want to take a guess at how how much their kicker scored? Who was scored? kicking for, their, for them today? Sean, they had Brandon Aubrey, who I saw earlier in the game, became the first kicker in NFL history to make a 59 and a 60-yarder in the same game. He also closed the game late with another 50-yarder. He also had a 45-yarder in the game and three extra points, 24.4. He scored more than Minnesota. Our opponent got 46 points out of their kicker and their D. We got 10. We are still projected to win. But by 3.1 points going into tomorrow, it is currently uh, – we are currently trailing by five. We do have Waddle and Achan. Our opponent has Mostert and Tucker Kraft tomorrow. It is tight end premium, so Kraft's a little bit of a bump there. We need Achan to really do a lot more than Mostert, who was banged up this week, was questionable, not even guaranteed to play until late in the week. Be nice to see Achan really go off and, and do much better than Mostert. But it is now – a certifiable, uh, a certifiable nail biter. When we were at one point today, Jean projected to to win by fifty in about. It was about the end of the morning games before the Viking game started, and their defense pitched this shutout, and their kicker came. I mean, their 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 defense and their kicker outperforming their expectations is the biggest reason they're in this game. Because I mean. I, I we could we, we I could throw a caveat on there that Hurts and AJ Brown didn't end up doing a ton. They combined for about 29 points. Usually you're going to see them score more than that. Um, but they they had all those bucks in the morning. And even though I mentioned a couple scored, they did not combine for a lot of points. They had Adam Thielen 12.4. Um, a lot of reasons that they were not going to probably put up a big number this week until their kicker and their D's combined, has combined for uh, 46. And now that's going to help them get to 140 point week. They were projected for a while to be like 110, you know, and, uh, are going to make this a game. <laughs> We're going to have to put up 150 to win. Yeah. I, let's let's embrace the positive and say this is what we wanted. We wanted to go into Monday Night Football and be excited about that game to see our Dolphins. And frankly, you know, if we're going to advance, Jalen Waddle needs to have one good game. So let's do it. Agreed. And I'm fired up. I'm excited. If we can't, I mean, if Jalen Waddle and Devin – H hand can't outscore a wounded Mostert and a backup rookie tight end, then we don't deserve to advance. And in terms of, of reversals, in terms of the week 14 roller coaster, I mentioned what happened to the team that Colum and I had and the Detroit Lions game. I got 
a message from Colm in the middle of the day before he has to go to bed because obviously they keep time a little differently there in Ireland saying it just it just wasn't our week it didn't it didn't work for us I had mentally given that one up and was thinking please grim barbarity of optics advance going one and two is better than zero and three and it's the team that we most want to get across then when i looked up the the live scoring right before we went to air somehow column and i were favored to win so our opponent has also not been lighting up the score in that one our opponent doesn't have 46 points from the kicker and defense yeah. in that battle yeah <laughs> That's uh, somehow I was also playing the Vikings in in another key spot. That Vikings DST. I mean, what a great decision by our opponent to pick up the Vikings DST. <laughs> the third, the third so, preference. Ben, I haven't watched this game, but if people have Josh Jacobs and. Devonte adams on their playoff rosters and fantasy should they cut them going into next week i mean you might as well is there a possibility so this not really there was talk that. after oh, the game there was talk but, after the game about potentially jimmy garoppolo taking back over so i mean maybe that will help i don't know then i have jimmy garoppolo as my third or fourth qb in some of these you know deep super flex or just super flex situations Picked him back up on a, t- in a situation where he had been dropped. I'm not exactly a Jimmy Garoppolo believer, but he is one of the best 30 quarterbacks in the NFL. And so it's just a yeah. little bit bad luck in some ways if he doesn't, uh, if he's not starting any given week. And I don't know if you've looked at his contract, but he is getting paid. <laughs> I, these guys, and he obviously has been hurt himself. We had the really sad news about Hunt- Hayden Hurst this week. When we make monetary or financial jokes about the players, they are just that jokes. Certainly, we don't begrudge them anything they're making, just like we don't begrudge entertainers or anybody who's making good money. Good good for you, and we're glad that, that those outcomes are out there. But Jimmy Garoppolo is getting paid a lot of money to sit on the bench. <laughs> yeah. they. I, I mean, I think after, after the game that, that they put out there today, we will probably see Jimmy Garoppolo again soon. That would be my guess. Um, if for no reason other than, you know, you have an interim head coach and they'd like to try to win some games. And I do think he probably gives them the best opportunity to win. And it's interesting because McDaniels got fired in part because he wasn't willing to bench Garoppolo. That was sort of the report that a lot of people wanted to see Aiden O'Connell play, but um you know, it's not not that it was all his fault today or anything, but certainly uh, not able to get any points on the board. Not ideal. Um, bummer in that game as well that Justin Jefferson then, comes just back. To, to kind of reiterate the note, um, that he was signed to a three-year, seventy-two million dollar contract. Okay, it is a lot of money. I was wondering when, when you were going to drop the hammer of the actual amount. <laughs> when Josh McDaniels wasn't willing to bench him it's like uh we 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 can't we can't afford to we we paid him 72 million (laughs) dollars we can't afford to we literally can't afford to um yeah justin jefferson came back took a big shot to the ribs went to the the hospital uh was unfortunately knocked from the game it was reported after the game that uh that was just to rule out any you know real serious stuff that would cause him to not be able to travel, but that he was back with the team and was traveling back to Minnesota. Hopefully it's just, uh, you know, it's like a obviously painful, but hopefully not broken ribs or anything like that. Hopefully it's, it's just a, a you know, a bruise and a, and a lot of soreness and he's no potentially able to, involvement or anything like that. Right. Kidneys. There's a lot of, a lot of question. And, and it seems like, again, hopefully I was talking on Sunday night and certainly not a doctor, uh, it sounds like that's going to be the case, and and hopefully that would mean that he could play in the relatively soon future and not miss extended period again. I know he wants to be out there playing, um, and anyone who's been waiting for him for their fantasy playoffs wants you know is is hopeful that that he'll be able to play. But as long as you know he's healthy enough to do so and not putting himself in any kind of risk, Sean. Any other final notes before 
we wrap it. Oh, uh, our my UW guy Jake Browning threw another fantastic 54 yard touchdown to Chase Brown. I don't know if you saw that. It was a dime. Just absolutely threaded the needle between his offensive lineman and the defensive lineman. It was a screen pass. His third straight game with a screen pass that's gone at least 25 yards. This one went for 54 and a TD. He had some nice passes down the field too, though. Had a had a good game in this one. Uh, they you really hate the, the fact that Keaton Mitchell and Chase Brown had the early season injuries because, I mean, those two dudes probably are not going to ever play quite to the level of, you know, hopefully an HN or a Gibbs. But when you talk about smaller backs with extreme speed who on any given play can take it the distance and add that electricity that their team needs. I mean, you're talking about those two guys, the Ravens backs didn't really do anything because of sort of the weirdness of that game today, but Mitchell did look good on the handful of touches he had. Chase Brown's touchdown. I mean, you're not going to see people run too much faster than that. It's not like there no. was, you know, great play by the defense, but you only make that play when you have extreme speed. Yeah, he looked incredibly explosive. I saw a couple of tweets that were like, "We haven't seen a Bengals running back look that explosive for a long time." And I was like, "Hey, other people think that Joe Mixon's not explosive because I feel like everyone just seems to think Joe Mixon's a little bit more explosive than he is, other than <laughs> the house here on stealing bananas." Um, but no, yeah, Brown looked incredible. I hypothesized at uh, stealing signals last week and telling some people to stash him that there's maybe a path to him playing a little bit more if the Bengals were out of it. That's going to be tough because the Bengals have won two games in a row. Um, I don't, they're not going to be out of it before the end of the fantasy season. They're now seven and six. And, um, I mean, I guess if they lost two in a row, then you could go into week 17 and be seven and eight and probably you're still i mean i don't know maybe at that like you're probably still playing joe mixon is what i was gonna say so you probably don't have that path to um them wanting to see what their their youngster has they did renegotiate or or restructure mixon's contract in august and he has another year on that but only like two and a half dead could save some money to release him i think there are some scenarios where they're moving on from him in the offseason and they are potentially interested in Chase Brown being a bigger part of their offense next year, or they add another back who knows, but we might see a little more Chase Brown down the stretch so they can kind of get a feel for what they do have. He looked great. I mean, certainly scoring a 55, four yard screen pass touchdown is not going to hurt that, that potential path. No, he's so small and you worry that uh, he's not so small. He hasn't been going down a lot easier at contact than Joe Mixon has. And again, that's something that will stand out to coaches. It gives you this David Montgomery, Jameer Gibbs sort of one-two punch. That would be the fear for me, would be that you go into the season and you can't really consistently rely on him, that you're in this kind of Keaton Mitchell area, can't really rely on him. You're not going to get the touches. Um, but I think you maybe you said it was, it was two and a half or something to that effect if it's two then again just for comparison purposes uh jimmy garoppolo has 14 times as much dead money next year so (laughs) the incentives to play jimmy garoppolo versus the incentives to play slash not cut joe mixon (laughs) well we we we're expecting jimmy garoppolo to be back on the field money talks money talks well ben this was a heart-wrenching anxiety inducing you know certainly heartburn full week of fantasy football you told me before we started the show that we had to record because uh you were a little bit concerned about a full body shutdown um (laughs) but it was fun and again this is this is the excitement of the fantasy finals and for most listeners you're going to have three weeks of that coming up and or you're going to have the sprints in the best ball then even with all the scoreliness today had a lot of ffpc best ball teams pushing into the advanced spots so that is pretty fun yeah i'm i'm both wired and exhausted from just another great weekend of we can't say reality football because there was enough bad reality football but the fantasy football awesome i mean sometimes you're out there 
and your kicker and defense score 46 points and allow you to win a title. So, No, lose a title by a smaller margin than you are going to. Don't put that out in the world. We still got two games on Monday night. <laughs> so it's been a lot of fun. Good luck to everybody because, as Ben mentioned, we do have the Monday night doubleheader. So much could still happen. We'll be back with another show a little bit later this week when – I'm sure Ben and I and all of our listeners will be winners at that point. It's been a lot of fun. I'm Sean Siegel with me as always is Ben Gretsch. Make sure you're following him at Yards Per Gretsch, at Stealing Signals, at Stealing Lines. We've mentioned some great comments and questions that have come up in the Stealing Signals Gold. Make sure you're signed up there. We'd love to have you guys over at Rotoviz. Use the coupon code RV Radio 2023 to get a 10% discount at checkout. And Ben, I know that for subscribers and potential subscribers of stealing signals and certainly potential subscribers of stealing lines and rotoviz that i mean if you want like the easiest christmas present that you can possibly ever purchase send someone in your family some subscriptions leave us a rating and review that helps us so much as we get into the holidays here we love you guys we'll talk to you soon